Another episode of 3D Printing News Unpeeled, courtesy of 3dprint.com. Today, uh, we're going to be looking at HB3D. Uh, HB3D is a kind of a company that makes uh, 3D printers, uh, medium format, large format 3D printers, a so large extruder mounted on a, a robot arm, six axis robot arm, and they use it to make. Uh, well, you buy the 3D printers, I think, but they also have a service. And one of the things they're doing is they're using uh, consumer waste, a so post-consumer waste uh, and material. And the material is called, they're made by Transmare, and uh, it's called Ultra Marathon. Uh, and they're taking that material and they're 3D printing it into uh, planters and plant pots and all sorts of outdoor garden things uh, for a company called Deco Drops. Um, these uh, large... Pots, I think, are quite attractive, actually, by the way. If you look at them here, I think the Moray effect actually here uh, is, um, well, usually you would want to maybe get rid of that in a print, but here it's actually quite attractive. Um, and uh, so, you know, and, and I think they're quite attractive things. Also, they sell from between like 180 to 1,200 euros, so that's a considerable amount of money for these things. And, um, you know, I think I think it's, you know, the right kind of interesting thing for somebody's pot or, or garden or, or something like that. So... What I like about this is that um, it's an application for medium format. And we're finding a medium format, large format, and finding very exotic 3D printing applications, like things like planters. But planters, there are millions of planters worldwide. They're all over the place. We don't really think of them as a, as a good thing for 3D printing, but I think that both in concrete and polymer, that planters and kind of garden furniture type of things and outdoor furniture type of stuff and outdoor stuff that your local city government would place actually a fantastic application. So this medium format, large format is really pushing us into new exciting applications on the one hand. On the other hand, what we're also seeing is that, um, that these guys are going to end use parts and things that are selling way earlier than, than, than another technology. So, so, so we're seeing a lot of it uh, very, cash driven developments here where people are selling things that are actually going out the money rather than people buying printers or buying services for speculative reasons. So I really like the, 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 this part of the business specifically for that uh, uh, reason. The next the news comes up from the International Journal of Bioprinting and a research paper authored by Antonio Martino, Martin Gonzalez uh, of the Hospital Universitario Dolce de Octubre in Madrid in Spain, uh, working together with a bunch of people people from that hospital and also the Polytechnic University of Madrid, what they did is, well, they looked at a problem, and that is that low birth weight babies, especially those um, uh, of uh, weights below a kilo, don't fit uh, the regular kind of uh, uh, masks, right, they used uh, to give them oxygen. Um, so what happens is they end up sometimes getting intubated for very long periods of time, which of course not very good for the lung development, not very good for them generally, and could lead to infection and stuff like this. Um, so what they did is very far, uh, is is they uh, three took a three D scan of a, a, a newborn uh, child, it's far, far too small to take the regular oxygen mask, and then they three D printed a mask that would fit the kit. Now, so I, I love this idea. I think it's a great idea. There, there's been some research as well for masks that better fit uh, different people's faces, like, uh, for example, uh, better fit for certain groups of people and all this kind of thing. So I, I really like this kind of development. Um, they use a Formlabs 3BL for this. Um, they also use a, a Elastic 50 resin with a shore hardness of 50 to make the final build material that they put on the child's face, only for two times two hours, but still... Uh, this is not something I would personally feel comfortable using on uh, uh, a child in such a way, uh, given the type of material it is and given the, what it's approved for. Um, and given also that there's some issues with SLA and leaching and, and stuff like that that maybe uh, would occur. And, and especially in a newborn baby, this it could have very detrimental long-term skin effects, especially if the part was not cured well. Uh, I personally would be much more comfortable if they would have uh, just used the, the 3D print as a mold and then made a silicone impression and then use that as a thing. And, and I'm also curious about, like, okay, does it really make sense to 3D scan this child to get a unique mask? Does it make sense a time type of uh, uh, scenario? The material is sterilizable to a certain extent? And, um, yeah, it could work. But how about if we make, like, 100 different sizes? Right, uh, and when you just make the hundred different three D prints, a hundred different sizes, then you made a hundred mold or lots of molds uh, with lots of sizes for the most minute of babies. Wouldn't that be much safer? Um, I don't know. I'm curious about that. I think I think so. On the one hand, it's good. The other hand, I'm, I'm, I have some misgivings about uh, using stereolithography materials, uh, methacrylic esters, these types of materials, uh, in in long ter uh, con long longer term skin contact applications. Um, so I'm, I'm not. I'm, 
they're specifically very happy with that. But just generally, uh, I think I think this research and making masks and medical equipment generally more accessible, better to fit lots of different types of faces is really a uh, very fruitful uh, idea uh, and area. The next bit of work uh, comes us from Valkyrie Savage, uh, the Department of Computer, Computer Science at the University of Copenhagen uh, in Denmark. Um, this is fantastic. Uh, the paper is called Air Logic: Embedding Pneumatic Computation and I/O in 3D Models to Fabricate Electronics-Free Interactive Objects. Um, <clears throat> so, what they're doing here, you can see it quite well on this uh, kind of thing, is they're making air channels essentially. And they've made some reference designs, if you will, of these air channels, these widgets, they call. And you could use these widgets to interact with an object. So you could print this air channel, and then someone could press on it or interact with it. And it is essentially, it's a flexible pneumatic circuit. Um, and the third, they made 13 widgets for so far. Uh, and you could do some kind of programming, if you will, some kind of logic, if you will, some kind of input and, and uh, varying degrees of output, depending on how you combine, use, and design these, cha uh, these channels. So if you look here, you've got a couple of these air logic uh, kind of channels, which some of them are very straightforward. Some of them take a little bit more time to look at them. But you can see already how you can like kind of change a system by, by pressing on it or by pressing on a little gate that opens and closes on it, or by pressing a, a, a lever that then moves a different part to inhibit this airflow. You could already see how you could use these widgets, and also ones you design yourself, to kind of make more complex objects where you can actually literally do kind of some pneumatic programming, or you, we could set an object to a certain, to do a certain quite complex there, a complex even sequence of things using this pneumatic uh, kind of programming kind of thing. Essentially, what they've done is they've created kind of an alphabet for soft robotics, so people can use this alphabet to, to make the soft robot do uh, pre-programmed things. I would be very excited to see how this would work if someone tried it in a nanoprinting type of a way, uh, trying to see if you can make very, very small nano micro channels do this, and then how complex you can make that. Um, what the team has done is combined a whole bunch of these different bits, if you will, uh, into more complex objects. Of course, they've used the bunny, which you have to do, kind of, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this to me is absolutely fantastic. I, I, I do not know at this point where we would need air circuits or air logic or how we would use it. Apart from this would be a very easy way to interact with soft robotics objects. And this would be a very interesting way to interact with an object that could still do very complex things, but would not need any wiring, would not need any circuits, uh, would not need any uh, electronics, but could uh, you know do a whole bunch of things in series. So I think uh, this is absolutely fantastic uh, thing. It would also be really cool to make toys with these things, by the way. Um, so this to me is, is absolutely fantastic. I, I don't, the end use application is part for making software products more usable, uh, usable and accessible. I don't know it as well, but I think this is absolutely fantastic work. So great, uh, great uh, to Valkyrie and all the other members of the team here, because I think this is fantastic. Um, and yeah, that's the news for today. Thank you very much and uh, have a great day. My name is Joris Peels. This is another episode of 3D Printing.